All right, and it's just after 12, so my name is Benji Cohen, Minnesota DNR, and you're here with uh, Jason Jack, Executive Director from the Red Wing Environmental Learning Center. We got a, a special program today. I'm super excited about it, being able to op offer the opportunity to everybody in the audience to uh, join a winter camping event that Jason's putting on uh, later this this winter, so he'll talk a little bit more about that. But uh, with that, again, if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A section there. We'll try to reserve the chat section for links and stuff. The Q&A really enables us to answer your questions and make sure we get to those. So I think with that, Jason, if you're good to go. I am. Problems here. What are you seeing right now, Benji? I'm seeing your full screen intro to winter camping. Okay, not my notes though. Nope. Okay, perfect. Let's get set here. So, awesome. So we're ready to go. I think you're good. Awesome. Welcome. Thanks for doing this. Yeah, no problem. Thank you for having me here today, Benji. This is an exciting opportunity, and I'm I'm happy to be with you all today. Um, as Benji said, my name is Jason Jack, and I'm the Executive Director of the Red Wing Environmental Learning Center here in Red Wing, Minnesota. And to our knowledge, the ELC is one of the oldest year-round centers for outdoor education in the state of the Minnesota. Uh, this year, we're celebrating 52 years of programming. Our philosophy follows an old Chinese proverb that goes, I hear and I forget, I see and I remember, I do and I understand. And so we believe very strongly that hands-on experience is the best teacher and that the outdoors is the best classroom. Um, I personally have risen through the ranks at the ELC from a 12 year old student to the field instructor to a program director and for the last 22 years um, as the executive director. Benji is actually one of our former students, um, so it's kind of cool. I began winter camping with the ELC at the age of 12 um, and I would estimate that over the last 40 years, I've probably been out winter camping approximately 275 nights. Um, to get really good at winter camping is, is no different than anything else you need to practice. And so today we wanted to share with you some basic information and this certainly isn't everything you're gonna to need to know, uh, but it will be a good start and kind of give you a good understanding. So one of the first questions that you're gonna to have to answer and people are gonna ask you is why do you wanna go winter camping? Um, and they will ask you. Uh, for each person, the reasons can be different. It can include bugs, you know, there's no bugs, there's no crowds. Um, maybe you wanna see amazing stars or even the Northern Lights. In my humble opinion, uh, camping in the winter is one of your truest tests of outdoor skills. If you can camp reasonably comfortably in the winter, uh, you can definitely do it well in the other seasons. I'll often ask our students um, at the completion of a long program, winter camping program, if they can think of anybody else that's done this. And typically they can count them on one hand. Um, and typically these are other ELC students. Um, so I think that winter camping brings with it some bragging rights as well. Um, not many people do it. And then finally, I've always felt that if you live in Minnesota, um, you have to be able to embrace all four seasons and winter is one of those seasons. So let's make the best of it and enjoy it. So one of the first things that you're gonna need to think about and, and get good at is clothing. And there's really no such thing as bad weather, just bad dressing. Um, and there's really four ways that you lose heat. And by understanding how you lose heat, you can then um, prevent that heat loss. And so the first way is conduction. And basically this is when you sit on something cold, like a snowbank, you feel that cold coming through. That direct contact is conduction heat loss. The second way that you lose heat is convection. And in Minnesota, we know this very, very well. We call it wind chill. We have a specific name for it. And we know that the temperature can actually be colder than the air temperature because of the wind. And so convection heat loss is a real thing that we need to figure out how to avoid. Um, wearing wind layers um, is one way to avoid this. Next, we'd have radiation. Um, you lose about 65% of your body heat through radiation. And so it's important that the more surface area you have uncovered, the more heat you're gonna lose. And so it's really important to protect from this type of heat loss. Putting on a hat is one of the quickest and easiest ways to prevent radiation heat loss. And then the last one is evaporation. Um, and this is heat loss due to moisture. Um, this can be from breaking out in a sweat because you're working really hard it could be from falling in a lake because you get wet, or it could be just snow down your neck or in your boots. Um, water takes away heat much faster than when you're dry, um, about 25 to 30% faster. So we really want to avoid these four ways that we lose heat. The next thing we want to look at and think about is, is our layering system. And we have three layers, three main layers 
um, as part of our layering system, our wicking, our warmth, and our wind. And so the wicking layer is the base layer. And it's basically it moves the moisture from your skin and, and helps keep you dry. It moves kind of out so it can dry off. Layers that might involve this would be silk, wool, nylon, polypropylene, rayon. Those would be all examples of kind of this layer. What you don't want to wear is you don't want to wear cotton. Um, we often say cotton kills. Once cotton gets wet, it stays wet. And again, we're going to lose heat much faster if we're wet. And so we really want to avoid that at all costs. <laughs> Our next layer is our warmth layer. And this is the middle layer. And there could be multiple layers in this one. Um, and for this layer, what you really need to think about is how does insulation work? And I don't care if it's the insulation in your home or the insulation in your down jacket. Insulation works by creating dead air space. And these dead air spaces capture kind of warm air. And so the, really the key to this layer is that everything needs to be loose and fluffy. Um, it cannot be tight and constricting. So examples for this layer might include uh, jackets or sweaters made out of fleece or wool or down. Um, and there can be multiple layers in here. Um, and you want to be able to adjust those layers. And then the final layer with the, the layering system is your wind layer, your outer layer. Um, and this is really the final layer, prevents that convection heat loss. But it also helps keep you dry, so it helps avoid the evaporation heat loss by keeping you dry from the snow falling on you or if it's raining by chance. Typically, this layer is a, a shell of some type that's waterproof and breathable. A few more things just about clothing. Um, again, I kind of said this already, but you really don't want it to be constricting. Everything should be loose from your gloves to your boots to your clothes. You don't want things tight. It kind of decreases the blood flow. And again, the materials that you're really looking to use are synthetics, uh, wool, fleece, down, but ultimately you wanna stay away from cotton. When you think about the boots that you wanna wear for winter camping and, and winter travels, um, highly suggest kind of the Sorel type pack boot. Um, they have a removable wool felt liner. Um, and on longer trips, you can actually take extra liners with you and substitute those out and basically have a brand new pair of boots partway through the trip. Um, so that, that removable liner is a key piece to this. And I should say that the clothing piece, it's, it's so situational and so individualized. Um, what I might, I might wear gloves and be completely comfortable and Benji might be out there and he's got to have mittens on, but so you have to read your own body and you have to listen to yourself, but gloves are certainly not as good as mittens. Uh, gloves separate your fingers, um, which causes them to typically get colder easier. Um, mittens are a great choice. They keep those fingers together and uh, they can kind of help keep each other's warm. Really highly suggest the, the picture you see here of the choppers. Um, these are just, a, if there was a Minnesota glove, this would be the one. Um, loose fitting, a wool liner. You can actually substitute and have extra wool liners. Um, they're just a great way to go. You can grab things off the fire and you don't have to worry about melting or burning them. Um, if there was a glove, I would recommend that would be the one. And then you move on to kind of your head and, and neck gaiters or your hat and neck gaiters. Um, as I said before, a tremendous amount of heat is lost through your head and neck. And so the quickest way to change that is either to put on a hat or take it off. And so as I'm skiing along and I start getting warm, the first thing I'll do is actually take off my hat and just stick it in my pocket. And I don't even have to stop to do that. And conversely, if I'm getting cold, I can put that back on. Um, your neck, again, anytime the, the blood flow comes near the surface of the skin, you're gonna lose a lot of heat. And so neck gaiter can help prevent some of that heat loss. And as we talked about with the evaporation, um, if you get snow in your boots, we've all had this happen, it melts and now your feet are wet. And so anything you can do to keep your feet dry uh, will help. So gaiters or snow pants that go over the tops of your boots certainly will help keep you drier and ultimately then will help keep you uh, warmer. So next we move on to food and hydration. This is a, a critical piece. Basically, if you're not you know, doing something like moving, building, building a fire, you know, working on whatever you're doing, you should be eating. And food is a big part of winter camping. Um, and it helps keep the energy up. It helps keep your, it allows you to stay warm. Um, eating warm things certainly is better. Um, and there's really nothing you can't bring on a winter camping trip from bacon to hamburger to pork chops. You know, the, the sky's the limit. Um, I'll often explain to our students that we kind of need to build a, a medical, metaphorical fire. And with any fire, you always start with kindling, then you put on logs, and ultimately the responsible thing is to put that fire out with water at the end. And so you can kind of use this, this analogy for keeping warm. And so the kindling piece of it is 
is sugars and fast burning things. They're quick energy things. Um, it'll warm you up, but it's not going to last long. Um, so candy bars, honey, those are kind of the kindling that kind of get your, your body moving in the right direction if you're cold. Okay. Once you got that fire started, now you're going to throw some logs on there. And for us, logs are your carbs and your fats. Um, these provide a longer, slower burn, and they'll keep you warm through the night and, and during the day when you're doing your activities. And things that might be in this category would be bacon, sausage, butter, you know, peanut butter, um, pasta, bagels. All those things would help keep you warm um, as you're going through the day. On our trips into the boundary waters and things like that, if it was really cold, sometimes we'd add our bacon grease to our hot chocolate or, or our um, oatmeal um, just to get those extra calories and extra warmth in there. And as I said, um, finally, you want to put out your fire. And so dehydration um, really causes your core temperature to drop. And so it's really important that you keep drinking in the wintertime. And people often feel like they don't need to drink as much because they're outside and they just don't feel as thirsty. Um, but it's really the responsible thing to do is to keep drinking water. Um, and so throwing water on the fire is responsible. Um, throwing alcohol on the fire causes the blood vessels below your skin surface to dilate, kind of creating this false sense of warmth and stealing heat. And so alcohol is a, a really bad thing when you're out winter camping. Some concerns that you might have while you're in the outdoors, and again, I'm just touching on some here, but you know, certainly frostbite, hypothermia, ice safety. Um, frostbite is one of those injuries that occurs from the freezing of your skin um, and underlying tissues. The first layer or the first step is kind of frost nip. And we've all had that happen when you come in and wash your hands in, in cold water and it just feels burning hot. That's frost nip. And it's it your skin comes back and it's, it's not a, a big deal. Um, if it keeps going and the skin actually freezes, it'll eventually come hard and waxy. Um, that's a big deal and we want to make sure we protect against that. And so uh, frostbite might be something you warm in the field. It might be something you actually come back to get medical attention uh, to warm it, depending on how severely it is. Sometimes you don't even realize you're, you're starting to become frostbit. And so it's important that group members kind of watch for each other and your nose, your ears, your cheeks, those are real common spots, fingers, toes, those are real common spots to kind of have that happen. Um, hypothermia is when your body loses heat faster than it can reproduce it. And believe it or not, statistically, there's more hypothermia that happens in the spring and the fall than the winter. But we always focus on this in the winter because I think it's just cold and everybody thinks that that's a big thing. But hypothermia is basically, again, when you're losing heat faster than your body reproduces it. Um, some signs that you might look for with people that that will be mumbling, fumbling, or stumbling. That means there's slurred speech, decreased coordination, maybe some confusion. Those would all be signs of hypothermia. And this is a life-threatening situation. And so it's really important that we get them warm. And so you'd stop, change clothes, put on layers, feed them, give them something warm to drink. Um, but you've got to address that and stop that before it goes any farther down that slope. Um, and ice safety. I, I know that there's been other presentations on this. Um, but really, no ice is ever safe, 100% safe. And so if it's under four inches, you really should stay off of it. Um, four to five inches, you could walk out there. Five to seven, you know, snowmobiles and ATVs can go out. Um, that eight to 12, small cars, and then 12 to 15, you know, medium pickups. But again, no ice is ever 100% safe. And then I, I throw in this kind of situational awareness, certainly being aware of weather, watching out for group members, kind of checking on each other, the ice conditions, those are all kind of the situational awareness things that I'm talking about. So we kind of walked through how to stay warm. Now we're getting to where we're actually going to set up a camp. And uh, there's some things that you want to consider with camp. And this is really no different than when you pick a camp in the summertime. Um, but some things that maybe are a little more important. Certainly we want to find wind protection. So we want to find shelter from the wind by using trees or points of land, snow banks, um, that will kind of protect our shelter from the wind. Um, you got to have a source of water. Um, typically on our trips, we will drill a hole in a lake and then treat or boil that water um, so that it's safe to use. Um, you can actually melt snow. Um, if you don't add a little bit of water to the bottom, it often gets a really smoky kind of um, bad taste to it. And it's going to take more time um, and use more stove fuel in the wintertime to melt snow. So water is a much better choice if you can get it out of the lake. Certainly consider where the sunrise and sunset is. Um, if you can get that morning sun, it'll help warm you up you know, right away when it's the coldest. You know, the mornings are usually the coldest, about a half hour before sunrise is kind of the coldest temp usually. And then you wanna be looking for you know, hazards and widow makers and bad ice when you're kind of setting up your tents and things like that. So 
if you actually are going to use a tent, which you can do in the wintertime, they certainly are quick and easy. They provide you shelter from snow, uh, but they provide very little heat retention. And so if you're going to set up a tent, you certainly want to pack down that snow with your skis or snowshoes and give that snow time to set up so you have a firm base to kind of set your tent on. While you're doing that, you could build a wall again to kind of block that wind. Um, and I would highly recommend using snow stakes. Regular tent stakes will not hold in the snow. They'll pull right out. Um, another way you can do is just bury logs, um, call them deadheads, and you could bury those in the, in the snow and that would help hold out your, kind of your guy lines. If you're gonna build a Quincy which, or a snow shelter, which we love to do, it certainly takes a lot of time. Um, it's great if you're gonna base camp. It's not something you're gonna do if you're moving from spot to spot. Um, and we typically will build them out on lakes because um, it's a nice flat surface, but uh, it doesn't have to be there. It can be done in the woods as well. And what you'll do is you'll throw this snow, you'll actually pack the snow down first and then you'll throw this snow up in a pile. And if you kind of rub your hands together, you can feel that friction. Well, as those snowflakes um, fall down over this pile of snow, they basically are rubbing together ever so slightly, creating a little bit of heat and they melt and freeze together. Um, and so if you give them, I don't know, about an hour and a half to two hours, um, it'll be hard enough that you can hollow it out. Certainly more time is better. Um, and the process of digging it out is, is a lot of work. Um, it's potentially very wet. Uh, again, you're digging in the snow. It's hard work, and so you want to take some time. And they do sometimes collapse, and so you got to be ready with kind of a plan B. Um, if, you're, if you're digging them out, certainly stay in a position where you can breathe. So if the collapse on you, kind of being on your hands and knees is a much better position. Um, I always try and keep somebody outside uh, in case that Quincy collapses and they can help dig them out and things like that. But once it gets big enough inside, um, you can either take a candle and kind of melt the inside to kind of ice it over, or even just take your hands and kind of rub it on there. And that'll create enough friction to kind of start melting it. And then it won't keep dropping snow on you all the time. At the same time, you'll also want to put a hole through it so that that warm, moist air from your breathing can escape the Quincy. Um, and then when we'd go to bed at night, we either put a, a toboggan or a sled or our packs in the doorway to kind of help hold the heat in there. The beauty of Quincy's is they stay about 25 degrees inside, so just below that freezing temp. Um, and if it's 20 below outside, it's still going to be 25 degrees inside that Quincy. And so they really do work well. They're very soundproof. So if somebody's snoring in the next Quincy, you wouldn't hear them. So that it works pretty well that way. And then finally, the beauty of winter camping is you can establish and, and create these elaborate cooking areas. As you can see in the picture here, you know, they've got spots to sit, they've got a spot to cook at. Um, there's your creativity and imagination can kind of take over here, which is really kind of a fun thing about winter camping. So now sleeping warm. Everybody wants to sleep warm. If you can't get a good night's sleep, it's going to cause for problems for the next day. And so having a quality mummy sleeping bag, one that kind of cinches around your head and, and has a draft tube um, is good. Synthetic materials I really like. Um, that way if they get wet, it still will keep you warm. But certainly down has come a long ways as well. Um, you want to shoot for a rating about 10 degrees below what you think your lowest temp is going to be. Um, most of our sleeping bags that we have are rated to about 25 below zero. Um, you could even consider using a liner bag too there. But um, just like we said with your dressing layers, you don't want to compress that insulation. Again, that it's the loftiness that keeps you warm. And that is why um, a lot of your heat is lost to the ground because you're laying on that and compressing all that insulation. And so it's important to have one or even two insulate pads to kind of separate you from the ground because you're losing all that heat to the ground. Um, I often like to think of your sleeping bag as a thermos. If you put cold things in a thermos, they stay cold typically for quite a while. If you put warm things in, they'll stay warm. And so you want to go into your sleeping bag warm. Um, not sweaty, but you certainly don't want to go in cold either. And then most beginners love to just kind of go all the way into the sleeping bag, basically bury their head and everything in there. And that is fine for maybe one night, but your breathing is creating moisture. And that moisture is being absorbed by the sleeping bag. And you can get away with it for one night maybe, but if it's an extended trip, you do not want your sleeping bag taking on water. And so you really want to keep your, your face outside of the sleeping bag um, so that, that moisture is escaping. Certainly consider eating a good meal, uh, building up that metaphorical fire that we talked about. You can even have a snack before bed of, of bacon or sausage. Um, maybe put a candy bar by your head so that if you wake up in the middle of the night um, and you're cold, you can, you can grab a quick snack. Um, and make sure you're hydrated. Keep drinking. I know 
the tendency would be to not drink because then I'm going to have to get up in the middle of the night, but you want to stay hydrated. Um, as you go into your sleeping bag, make sure you've changed your clothes and that you're in dry clothes or if, if they're at all damp, it's just a little bit. If you do have some damp clothes, you can actually lay them between your, your pads or your sleeping bag and your pads and they'll dry out. It'll also create more insulation from the ground. And so that's an important thing. Um, hot water bottles. So this is a this is a just an amazing way to go and it works really, really well. And there's not too often that I'll say you gotta use this brand, but Nalgene has time and time again proved to me that they don't leak. Um, if you have a water bottle that leaks, you don't want that in your sleeping bag with you. And so before bed, we would actually fill up Nalgene water bottles with hot water. I usually do two of them, uh, one for down by my feet and one that I kind of hold on to. And you want to put these water bottles into a wool sock. Um, this does a couple things. One, it helps insulate that bottle so it lets the heat out slower. And secondly, it keeps you from burning yourself. If you just put it in your sleeping bag with you, they're really, really hot. And uh, you actually could burn yourself. And so putting them in that wool sock helps a ton. And it'll probably keep warm till about four in the morning. Okay. If you wake up in the middle of the night and nature's calling, it's really important to answer that call. I know it is so hard to get out of your sleeping bag. It's nice and it's warm, um, but you're gonna be cold after a while and you're not comfortable, so you're not sleeping anyway. And so the best thing is to get up, go to the bathroom, settle back in, you'll be warm and comfortable. And when you go to bed, you can even wear your boot liners to bed. That keeps them warm the next morning, so you're not putting on cold boots. Also helps dry out those liners so that they're, they're ready for the next day. As far as staying warm, um, it's really much easier to stay warm than get warm. And this is so true. Um, your body realizes that your head and your, your torso are kind of the core areas. You can't live without those areas. And so if water's going, or if blood is going out to your fingertips, or your toes and coming back colder, your body's gonna to start to shunt that blood back towards your core region. Um, you can live without your arms, you can live without your legs, but you can't live without your core region. And, and your body seems to understand that. And so it will sacrifice those areas. So if you keep the head and torso warm, then warm blood can go out to those areas. Um, while you're traveling, again, you wanna dress in layers and you wanna shed layers as you need to. If you're getting too hot, stop and take off a layer. You know, Open up your jacket, kind of let yourself breathe a little bit. Um, if it's windy, uh, make sure you cover up that skin um, so you don't get any frostbite. Um, and again, you're gonna be warmer while you're traveling because just the sheer activity and the exercise. So when you stop, make sure you put those layers back on, put your hat back on, put your, your jackets back on, kind of trap that heat that you generated so that you don't do that. Don't lose that heat. Um, but you want to try and avoid sweating at all costs. And then we have a phrase, and I'm sure everybody's heard this, if your toes or fingers are cold, put on a hat. And that, again, goes back to that radiation heat loss. If I adjust that, I can certainly keep my toes and fingers much warmer. And that's kind of the whole goal of this is to be enjoyable and safe. Now, in the wintertime, there's a lot of ways you can travel. You can use skis, snowshoes. You can hike. Um, some people like dog sleds. Um, what I love about the wintertime is you can use a polk sled, which means you don't have to put things in a backpack. You can actually pull it behind you. Um, and so there you see in the picture kind of a polk sled. Sometimes you'd attach it to a smaller backpack. Um, sometimes they even have backpack, you know, waistbands that kind of help you pull it. But whatever way you want to travel, um, you need to kind of work on that. And there's so many different ways to go in the wintertime. And then the question is, where do you go the first time? You know, and I think it's so important that you test your equipment equipment where there's low consequences. So it might be right out your back door. Um, that's a, a great spot to, to test what you've got. If it isn't working, you can go inside and it's not life-threatening. Um, but have an exit strategy kind of ready to go. There certainly are some state parks and natural areas that allow winter camping, which is pretty cool. Um, I would highly suggest try some of your typical favorite camping spots and experience them in the winter. Um, it's a completely different experience. Some of my favorite trips have been to the Boundary Waters. Um, again, these are typically extended trips and, and you have to practice minimum impacts and such, but a beautiful area to be and not many people use it in the wintertime, which is really, really cool. So kind of wrapping things up here, and I know this has been a lot of information in a short amount of time, but Benji and I were talking and we wanted to provide an opportunity uh, for anybody that was, was game to try this to actually try your skills at winter camping. And so we're gonna take 10 people, the first ones to register, um, we'll have you pay kind of a non-refundable deposit of hundred bucks. The whole thing will be 200 bucks, but you'll go to the ELC website and there's a tab that's that's been created there called Winter Camping 101. 
We're asking that people be fully vaccinated and boosted um, because we'll spend time in the cabin and we'll be in close quarters. And so that's just one of our requirements here. Um, but on February 8th, we'd do a virtual orientation. And then we'd actually go on a trip February 25th to the 27th. Um, that $200 would include transportation, equipment, and lodging. We would actually leave the, the Twin Cities about four o'clock. Um, we'd drive up to this cabin here that you see. This is our cabin up in two harbors. We'd spend the night there. And then the next morning we'd get up, build shelters and you'd spend the night in those shelters. And we've got winter sleeping bags if you don't have one. Um, and we've got all that specialty equipment from snowshoes and skis that you'd need. And uh, you can try your hand at, at winter camping. And then the next day we'd return back to the Twin Cities about four o'clock. Um, so again, uh, to register for that Winter Camping 101, you go to our, just our website, redwingelc.com, and you'll find a tab for Winter Camping, and you can kind of fill out that form, and then I'll contact kind of the first 10. We're not going to try and pick, but we'll just go with the order. So with that, hopefully that gives you a better understanding of some basics of Winter Camping. I know it was a lot in a real short time, but um, I can answer some questions now too, I suppose. Yeah, thanks so much for doing that. Yeah, one question on there, the, the virtual presentation, when was that? Um, February, let me go back to it here. Um, we'll do that February 8th from 7 to 8 p.m. It'll be just virtual. So I'll send a link to everybody. Must be the eight, yeah. You meant the 18th maybe? It's the 9th today, so. Sorry, 18th. There we go, okay. Somebody was quick on the draw and caught that, so. That's good. And like, yeah. So this is this is kind of a, a new event for us that and, and thanks Jason and the room you'll see for being able to provide that. Um, you know, an opportunity to learn about winter camping in a safe environment and then an opportunity to go out and do it. I think this is, is pretty cool. So and like Jason was saying, it's it's one of those things in, in Minnesota that you can get out and enjoy the winter and and uh see some it's just incredible i love i think one of my favorite memories i had a group of kids up in the bounty waters and we were out there ice fishing in the middle of winter and we saw a wolf coming across the lake down the lake from us and uh it's it's super cool so i, I love getting up there in the winter it's it's great so yep. no i totally agree uh we got a couple of questions are there any special preparations or gear for people who already have frostbitten toes who are more vulnerable to refrostbite. That's absolutely a, a, a point kind of thing. Once you frostbite something, it's more susceptible to that. You just need to be hyper vigilant about that and making sure that you're doing everything. It's the layering is the key kind of thing and, and just awareness. And so being aware of how your toes are feeling. And if you can keep that core region warm, um, that directly affects your toes and fingers. So, but beyond that, there's really nothing you can do. Maybe toe warmers, but I don't like to rely on those kinds of things. Um, I think you're better off using proper dress and just awareness to help you kind of get through that. Hey, great. Uh, another person was asking, she's not able to make it to this February event, but she's wondering if you have any other events planned um, that would include adults and stuff from our audience. So. We do, yeah. So you can check out our website. Each season we have some adult programs and uh, some different programs that we offer here kind of thing. Um, so yeah, you can check out our website and each quarter we send out a new newsletter. Um, so you can contact the ELC and uh, let us know you want to get on our mailing list and we could add you to that mailing list. So it's all virtual. You got to apologize. I'm dealing with a little bit of a cold. So I'm sipping on a ginger ale here and keep hitting my mute button in case I cough. But um, like Jason was saying, the, the ELC is a, a great program down there. I went through that program also, and um, it's it's a lot of fun. So uh, Eric was wondering, do you have any resources for lining up hot tents through Outfitters in the BWCA? This is hot tenting is kind of a new a new thing that is getting bigger and bigger. So yeah, and I don't have specific contacts with that. Again, we kind of operate in house, and so we don't use a lot of Outfitters, and so I don't have connections with that. Unfortunately, I'm sorry. I know I've seen some stuff up in, in Canada, and I think there's one outfitter up in the Boundary Waters Ely area that does rent hot tents, I've heard, but I don't know it off the top of my head either, so. Yeah, I think you can start contacting any of those outfitters in that, you know, in the Ely or North Shore area, and 
if they didn't have it, they'd be able to point you towards somebody who maybe did. Yeah. Uh, Bree was asking about separate tents for winter camping. There's, you know, summer tents, three season tents, a four season tent. Um, does it really matter with proper site setup? Yeah, so there is a slight difference, but again, there's not a, mo a lot of insulation value in a tent, um, but the four season or the, the heavier ones will shed the snow better uh, when you get a snowfall on top and they will have kind of a double wall system to them that will help moisture not build up in there as much. Um, and so there are certainly tents that are, are more adaptable and more usable in the winter time. Um, but again, you're not getting a lot of insulation compared to like a Quincy. I mean, a Quincy will stay 25 degrees inside, even if it's 20 below outside. Um, and so that's a huge insulation factor, but you're not gonna build one and move every day. That's just too much work. If you're going into a spot in base camping, then a Quincy makes total sense. It is the way to go, to be honest with you. Great, uh, my favorite's the Quincy, but um, Chelsea was asking about wicking, warming, wind blocking principles. Do they apply to the feet also? Do you use synthetic layer of socks under your wool socks? Yep, you, across the board, you wanna use that, that layering system, um, even your hands, your feet. So they make kind of a thin uh, polypropylene sock or a glove liner, um, and that works well underneath your wool sock. And again, what it's doing is it's pulling that moisture from your skin, kind of between your skin and that sock, and moving it between the wool sock and that polypropylene sock, so it can dry out. Um, and that way you're not feeling the moisture kind of thing. So absolutely across the board. And again, synthetics, um, and kind of those natural fibers across the board. Cotton is really the only thing I would say to stay away from in the wintertime. That is the big one. We had a great experience this weekend. I was doing a dog sledding program in Cottage Grove area, and my wife stepped through the ice. So having a dry pair of socks is always key. So I had a dry pair of socks in the truck, put them on, and kept on going. Uh, Bill was wondering about the February 18th program. The winter camping experience is that open to everybody or just the top 10? Uh, It'll be the first 10 that kind of sign up kind of thing and, and make that deposit just because then we I, I don't have to try and pick or say, oh, this person's in, this one's not in. So I know it's kind of quick, but you'll have to decide quickly here. Yep, it's coming up fast. Um, this is something we're going to try to continue doing through our MOS programs if we have the ability to do it is having you know, partners like the Red Wing ELC offer some of these these trips so and it kind of just goes to people that tune in live which is kind of fun uh, steve had a great question about you touched a little bit on hand warmers and toe warmers they have also have battery operated warmers and i actually have a pair of um use like zippo lighter fluid in them and, yep. and use those do you recommend those what's your thoughts on those so again if you're out ice fishing or something you know just a day thing they work and they work really well you know if you got kids with with that are susceptible and don't have great circulation, they're a great use for a day program. I would not rely on them for an extended trip. You know, if you're doing multiple days out, um, it's not what you want to depend on. Um, if you use those layers, if you keep your core warm, if you eat properly, if you do all those things that we talked about, you won't need those. You just won't. I was actually, so, so those of you that don't know, I have, my sister works up in Alaska and I get to go up and work on that did rod. And there's a lot of the mushers that bring those chemical pads with, but they say the same thing. It's great for in an emergency when you're out and you need something quick to warm up. But if you rely on them, you're just, you're underdressed. So yep. use proper clothing is the best, best option there. So. Yep, and having backup clothes to go to, you know, if something gets wet or you're building a Quincy and you almost have to plan on sacrificing that layer that you had because a lot of times you're just, you're crawling in the snow, you know, it's, you're getting sweaty, those clothes, it's going to be hard to dry them out. And so sometimes that just has to be a lost cause for those, that layer. Which kind of brings us to the next question too. Chelsea has used ice fishing tents for winter camping with foam pads on the floor. And she was also asking about hot tenting which if you're using an ice fishing tent, had a little heater in there, we call that hot tenting, so. Yep, yep, nope, that would work. And again, those are set up and they're, the structure is different in that they can kind of shed the snow better. Um, and that's an important piece of this, this winter camping is that the, the design is made to, to withstand that, that pressure. 
Uh, Jesse was wondering about any precautions that you need to take due to wildlife while winter camping. You know, in the summer, everybody talks about hanging a bear bag and stuff. Obviously, the bears aren't out in the winter, but anything else, you know, uh, lynx, wolves, anything like that that you need to worry about? You know, like anything, you take care of your food, you put it away, but I mean, you'll have some animals come into your camp sometimes, but again, it's it's not as bad as the other seasons, you know, as much isn't moving. We've had martens and things come in and, and raid our camps, you know, as far as gorp and things like that, or squirrels. Um, but beyond that, you know, you don't have bears. There's not as many wildlife things um, to see. Actually, it's easier to see wildlife in the wintertime, which is pretty cool. So that's kind of an upside to that is that it's typically a little quieter and, uh, you know, the snow makes them stand out. So you see them quicker. Um, so you'll see a deer or moose, which is pretty fun. You can track them. It's great for tracking. Too. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, Holly was asking about those gloves that you recommended. What are they called or what brand it is? Well, there's no certain brand, but they're, we call them leather choppers, but they are just the best. Um, you can order them on Amazon or anywhere kind of thing. A lot of your, your local farm and fleet stores will have them, but they make different ones. There's one that isn't lined. Um, and those are the best ones in my opinion, because then you can buy the wool liners and you can buy two pair. And basically it's like having two pairs of gloves with still the same outside. Um, if you get the ones that are insulated, if they get wet, now you've lost those as well. So just I think they're the the best glove ever. I mean they're they're great for walking your kid's nose or grabbing something out of the fire. You know, they're just a, a great it should be a Minnesota glove, period. I think I think you hit on it. It probably is a Minnesota glove. We just haven't seen it in the book yet, but Yep. And they're they're just so great because you can grab things off the fire so you don't have to worry about, you know, what the way we cook, we use, you know, pots and things and you can grab it off and not worry about burning yourself, or you can grab logs. Um, that are on fire, you just, they won't melt. Um, they're just a great glove. Yep, I love I love a good pair of choppers. So, another question. This is this is an interesting one. I'm gonna, curious how you'll <laughs> answer this. Um, drying boots and ski boots. So yeah. I've I've been out with several kids, as have you, and we've seen people melt their boots. What's your recommend <laughs> recommendation in drying stuff out? Putting things by the fire, nothing good ever happens. Um, so again, winter, you really got to take care of your stuff. And so you really got to bring your A game, which is why if you can do it comfortably in the wintertime, the other seasons are a little bit easier. But nothing good ever happens when somebody's trying to dry their boots out next to the fire. I've seen them melt or start on fire, and uh, that's not good. You don't want that kind of thing. So taking care of your equipment, protecting your, your ski boots. So if you're using both Sorrells and ski boots, um, taking those ski boots into your tent at night, you know, maybe putting a hot water bottle in them to help dry them out a little bit um, might be a good idea. Fire is not the place to do it. I mean, I know it's tempting and I know it's the easy thing, but nothing good ever happens there. There's nothing more frightening to me than coming up with something. I got cold feet and they got their feet in their boots about this far from the fire. <laughs> like yeah. those, they're made to insulate, so you're not gonna feel it until they're actually on fire. Yep. And that's why, like, the Sorel or the pack boot kind of model is good because you can bring extra liners. And so if they did get wet or they something happened to them, you melted them kind of thing, you can always stuff another pair in there and away you go. You know, so they're really – it gives you options. And that's a critical piece to winter camping is make sure you have some options and take care of your gear. And going into this next question, too, I got a, a funny story from the ELC when you're up in Two Harbors one time. <laughs> uh, you know, you're talking about taking care of your gear. And one of the kids left their liner in their boot out front of their tent and it froze solid. It was in the negative 20 to 30 degree range up in two harbors. And of course they can't get it on in the morning, right? Nope. It's gonna crunch down. So we ended up taking a spare pair of liners that he had and putting in a sleeping bag, um, you know, a couple of pairs of socks, his spare liners and a sleeping bag stuff sack over top of that liner so that we could, um, you know, it was, it was a day we were getting out anyway so we were able to get out until he got his boot warm um this one we were building a, a yurt up there for the okay. northfield elc but um we went into the yurt and we had a little propane heater in there and we thought well we'll just get out there and we'll fire that heater up and we had some work to do and kind of indoor stuff so leading to this next question in your experience what's the lowest temperature a fuel canister can withstand before it, it just doesn't work and that morning was one of those 
I'm not for sure what the, I guess, vaporizing point of propane is. I know it's it's way down there, but at 23, 24 blow, whatever it was that day, we had a, a tough time getting that yeah. propane to flow and get that heater going. So, Yeah, yeah, I don't know the exact temperature that you'd have those issues kind of thing. Um, certainly using up kind of a fire paste um, to help warm things and kind of pre-warm things. And once you get it going, it's going to warm itself up kind of thing. But the trick would be getting it going kind of thing. And so I don't know the exact temperature. You know, we've, we usually just build fires. We don't often use stoves in the wintertime. Um, they're certainly convenient and they have their place. Um, we just like working on our students' ability to build a fire and practice that skill. And that's why we use that a lot. It also creates warmth for you beyond what a stove does. And so that's, there's kind of a, a side benefit there as well. Um, I do know that if you're using say a white gas stove or something like that, you gotta be really careful about spilling any of that fuel on your hands because it's basically a super chilled. Um, and so you can frostbite yourself almost instantaneously if you spill it on your hands or you know other extremities. And so you really wanna be careful with, with stove fuel, especially white gas in the winter time. Yeah. It's I'm kind of the, it depends on the fuel I suppose like butane and I don't use a stove a whole lot in the winter either but yeah it's most an interesting question fire building but yeah good question so here's one more on a, on a personal topic I guess I have daughters so I get this a fair amount but Chris says as a woman I learned not to wear snow bibs in winter camping because you have to undress to use the bathroom yep uh, and that's that's always a concern for that so they do make um i don't even know what you call them i know there's a uh, funnel apparatus and stuff for women that yep. um, some girls have used before on trips that yep. seem to work really well but yeah yeah and again it's it's uh, dressing in layers it's not that one big layer and that's that's why you kind of want to stick with that as well um and it's a challenge i mean there's no doubt about it you know for everybody in the winter time so but there's nothing better in the middle of the night when you have to get out of that cold sleeping bag and you go out and answer nature's call and then you run <laughs> back and crawl in and it's like instantly warm. It just seems, it feels so good. So. It seems counterintuitive and it, it truly, it's hard to leave that warm sleeping bag. It's like, oh, do I want to go to the bathroom? Do I not want to go to the bathroom? You're laying there, you're awake anyway. Um, you might as well go to the bathroom because when you do come back, it'll be warmer. You know, your body isn't using that energy to help keep that that urine warm or whatever. And so you're getting that out of there and then you're coming back and you're able to rest them, you know, otherwise you're just laying there tossing and turning. Uh, Deb, I'm just looking at the chat. I think we got all the Q and A answered. Uh, Deb asked, what's the coldest temperature you've camped in? So I, you want to go first, Jason? You're you talking know, about breaking yeah. rates. Yeah. Well, <laughs> you know, I've been out and it's been 20, 25 below and that's without a wind chill. So that's, that's, pure temperature. Um, and again, it's if you're dressed properly and you're moving and taking care of yourself, I mean, winter camping is a lot of work. You're always doing something. If you're not doing something, you should be eating, you know? So you are constantly, it is one of the things where you're working a lot, but it wasn't that bad. You know, if you keep things covered up, keep moving, you know, and you work quickly, you know, when you have to stuff your sleeping bag, you know, and you have to take your choppers off, you stuff quick and you get your choppers back on. You don't dilly dally and take your time with it. You, you move quickly. How about you? How long? What's yeah. uh, what's your coldest temp? Do you remember? I hit mine was uh, forty three below, so Ooh. up in the up in the Boundary Waters, and it was one of the most memorable trips. It was for the uh, Heart and Lung Association. I don't know if you remember they used to run trips in the Boundary Waters, and you can you know pay as kind of a fundraiser thing, and you go up there and you know raise so much money, and you go along for the for the trip up there. And uh -huh. I get asked by Bill Simpson, I think was the guy's name. Me and Mark Gerke, I think from the, mm -hmm. he was an ELC kid, went up there to help. Uh, two of the people had um, heart surgeries and they didn't want to pull the sleds in. They, they were good enough to walk, but they didn't want to kick the extra weight and stuff. So we kind of went as long as, as helpers up there, but one of the guys brought his little weather station with and it was 43 blow one morning when he woke up, so. It's cold. It's, I was telling Craig we went to build a. When it's that cold, I mean, you, you can eat. You know, you're not, there's no such thing as a diet when you're camping, right? You nope. eat a nope. straight stick of butter if you have to. Yep. You're eating about everything, and we we're 
just kind of playing in the snow and doing some sledding with the sleds just to keep moving and keep warm. And we had a great time, but we decided we were going to build a Quincy hut. And it was so cold out that we couldn't get the snow to stick. Yep. Was, every it time we started dry. hauling out, it just fall in. So. Yeah. And that's those, the key with those Quincy's is that, you know, it's got to be the right temperature. If it's too cold, that, that snow becomes very dry. And it's the moisture content in the snow and the temperature outside that really solidifies it. And one thing I was going to add is, you know, once you build those Quincy's, you know, we've stayed in them for, you know, two, three nights at a time kind of thing. By the end of that time, you can put 10 people on top and they don't cave in. You know, they become very strong. Hey, one question about your email. Was it rwelcjason at gmail? Gmail. Yep. So anybody interested in that, I'm going to put that back in the chat. I will grab your your website link. And hopefully, you know, I'd love to hear some stories from from this event. If um if anybody does join the trip in February to go up to the cabin and and spend a experience the night out in the woods in a little winter camping. Yeah. I'd love to hear that. So and we had a group of uh seventh graders up there just last weekend doing that. So great. I think Craig, I don't know if you see any other questions. I think we got them all in there. Thanks, everybody, for joining. I see we had over 70 people in here today. Jason, thank you so much for, for joining us and sharing some of your passion and knowledge about the outdoors with us and, and providing this opportunity for our audience. I think it's it's pretty cool, and I hope everything goes well, and I hope people get to experience a, a great Minnesota winter and get some bragging rights. Yep. No, it's winter's one of our seasons, and we got to embrace it. So it's, there's a reason we live here. So. Thank you for the opportunity. You bet. I think with that, I'm going to end the recording. Uh, we'll see everybody next week. Oh, and I forget what the program is next week, Craig. Can I help me out? Just looked at that ahead of time, but we'll see everybody next week for another Moss Talk. And with that, we'll pop into the back room.